Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Janine Clayton, the Director of the Office of Research on Women's Health, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here to the National Women's Health Week panel event. For this year, the Office of Research on Women's Health hosts an event every year during National Women's Health Week, and our event today is Meet the Faces of Clinical Research Beyond Inclusion. So thank you so much for being here. Just like Mother's Day is just one day in the year that we honor our mothers, Women's Health Week is just one week in the year uh, that we highlight women's health specifically. But we do it every day, 365 days a year, sometimes on the weekends, very often at night, but every day uh, in terms of, of, of our work on women's health. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's gathering, which is a conversation. You see from our setup, it's a little different from a typical Lipset Auditorium event, but this is a conversation, and I really would like you to be part of that conversation. I challenge you to share your thoughts, ask your questions, uh, and don't hold back from interesting ideas or comments that you want to make. We really want to hear from you. We have phenomenal special guests today uh, that include women who are clinical research volunteers and the health professionals that support them, and many other people who participate in clinical research. Together, these people graciously give their time and talents and effort and energy, and because of all of that, they create new knowledge that advances all of our health. Today, we're celebrating the many faces of clinical research and women of different backgrounds who are confronting different health issues. Each of us is an individual, and when all of us are a patient, we all have the same feelings about where to go. And we are also looking at uni using unique and personal strategies to help themselves, ourselves, and everyone. So thank you, everyone who joins us today. This year, 2015, is also a really special year uh, at NIH. The Office of Research on Women's Health is 25 years old this year, so we should clap for that. At 25, you still think you can do everything and change the world, and we still think we can do everything and change the world. Uh, it's been also more than 20 years since a federal law required that women be included in NIH-supported clinical research, and today women are roughly 50% of all NIH-supported clinical research. That is great news. <laughs> However, in 2015, we are at another turning point. One year ago today, literally one year ago today, NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins and I announced that NIH will be taking action to assure that NIH-funded researchers account for sex as a biological variable in their preclinical research. And we took this very important step because, unfortunately, for the most part, those preclinical studies before we go into the clinic have been done primarily in males. Why does that matter? because males and females are different right down to our DNA. While women and men get the same diseases, aside from those that only affect women or only affect men, the prevalence and risk factors for diseases may be different, like autoimmune diseases, much more common in women than men, or cancer, some cancers like lung cancer, which has a different profile in women than men, or the symptoms may be different, like heart disease. As we know, women who are having a heart attack may not have crushing chest pain. They may not feel like an elephant is sitting on their chest, and we need to understand why that is. In fact, we've learned in the last year that medications, and specifically uh, one medication, sleep aid Zolpidem, the recommended dose is half for women than for men. So we've got a lot to, lot to learn, and our differences are important every day. So in 2015, we are working hard to put in place new policies toward expanding the foundation of preclinical research to understand both female biology and male biology. This information, as it grows, will inform our future clinical studies and will lead to better health outcomes for women and men, boys and girls. Now, another key point that hardly needs mentioning is that not all women are the same. Look at this beautiful and varied audience. We're not all the same. Just like women are not some sort of alternate version of a man, uh, children are not small adults, uh, we need to consider all of the factors that drive our health and affect our uh, risk for illness and disease. Race and ethnicity, our jobs and recreational interests, where we live, 
our cultural influences and behaviors, things within our control and things not in our control. Let me close by saying today we celebrate women and their health and recognize the spectrum of issues that define us as individuals and also play a role in our health. All of us here, research volunteers, scientists, government employees, and friends and family, and thank you to all of you who've come today, are partners in advancing health. Thank you for all that you do. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, a friend, colleague, and incredible woman, Dr. Lauren Wood, who is visiting us today from the National Cancer Institute. If I could use one word to describe Lauren, and she's sort of blushing, it would be passionate. As you'll hear today, Lauren is an energetic and caring doctor who really enjoys working with her patients. She tests new cancer and HIV therapies. And I said, as I said, she brings a spark to everything that she does. I know you'll enjoy hearing her and the rest of today's voices. Lauren? So um, I want to thank Janine and the staff of ORWH for the opportunity to just speak with you briefly. And since the focus of this session was really to be about a conversation, um, and there was not a requirement for slides, um, but I was like, no slides! Ah. But I've got 20 minutes, and I only have 12 slides. So for any of those of you who have ever seen me speak, normally I'm like my colleague, Dr. Lori Weiner. I have 60 minutes, and I have about 80 slides, and I can get through them, 30 seconds a slide. But I only have 12, and I hope that this is um, going to just be an introduction to the conversation that we're going to have and take advantage of with our panel participants um, and everyone that's here in the audience. So, you know, people talk about the P's and Q's, and I actually was like, gosh, what was that originally for? But uh, I'm going to talk about the P's and C's of a, a career in clinical translational research as an introduction to our conversation. So it's a little bit ironic that um, Janine said she would describe uh, me as passionate because the first P is actually passion. And this, listen, these slides were done this morning. This was not coordinated. But um, of the five Ps that I believe that you have to have um, in whatever career path you choose, I believe actually passion is the first thing. Because you have to love what you do and do what you love. Because Social Security is going to run out of money way before we all need it. We might be working much, much longer than we think. And so it's really, really important to identify those passions because it's been my experience throughout my uh, academic and personal life that those people who are most passionate about what they do, and I don't care if they're doing landscaping, I don't care if they're baking cupcakes, I don't care if they're doing cutting edge science at the NIH. The issue is, is the people who are most passionate, they have the most incredible stories, they have the most awesome achievements, they have the most powerful impacts, um, and they have it with an attitude that's really other focused rather than self-focused when there's that true passion. To me, true passion always has to be outward focused rather than inward focused. So that's my first P. The second P, of course, is people. Whether they are patients, friends, colleagues, family, um, in the end, no matter where our technology takes us in its level of sophistication and complexity, I mean, it's absolutely incredible because you can be in the bush of Africa and you can download the ESPN results um, from your smartphone that's powered by a solar battery. I mean, it's absolutely incredible the kind of technology and advances and things that we have at our fingertips to impact our lives. But the bottom line is, is that 
people and relationships will always be the single most important focus of your entire life. And the context in which you do it professionally and how you um, develop and nurture and foster those relationships, people always will be and need to be the priority. Um, I think if we had that focus in kind of some other areas of our government where it's not about agendas or lobbyists or organizations and it's really about what is best for people and the common good and seeking that, we'd see some differences. But people have to be the second P. The third P is perspective. And, you know, I like the left-hand slide. It's, it's, it's incredible what you can find on Google Images. It really is, you know? And you just take a screenshot and boom, it's up in your slide presentation. And, you know, uh, I, perspective is so important. And I think one of the issues that um, Dr. Clayton has raised and I hope comes out of this panel is the importance of diversity and inclusion and diversities of perspective. The right-hand side, rose-colored glasses, all right? Not everyone sees the world through rose-colored glasses. Some people have green glasses, blue glasses. There are lots of different perspectives. But I think it's so important, and we keep understanding more and more as science becomes truly a multidisciplinary enterprise that we can't all stay in our silos of, I'm a chemist, I'm a biologist, I'm a physician, I'm a bioinformatics person, I'm IT, um, I'm a communication specialist, because the issue is, is that diversities of perspective allow you to ask some very incredible questions and um, allow you to identify answers and go down roads that you never even thought of um, as it relates to the simple issue of including both male and female gender animals in preclinical animal model studies is really quite revolutionary because the issue is, is that we as scientists, we ask the questions. But the issue is, is that if you don't ask the question, you'll not get an answer. Um, I, I go back to the issue of the human microbiome, which is now about 10 years old. And, you know, we all knew this. We all knew that we had bacteria in our mouth, in our guts, in our noses, on our skin. You know, we were co-colonized and, and so forth. But until somebody started asking, you know, it's not just skin bacteria. I mean, how, how do we live with this incredible trillion community of microbes? And it turns out that our microbes are pretty important. They're, they're, they govern our own universe, the, the function of our immune systems. It's absolutely fascinating. So diversity of um, perspective really allows us to start to ask some very unique questions and get very, very important answers that literally can revolutionize our world. The next P is providence. You know, um, when I Googled this and I Googled the word of providence, the only thing that I came up with was pictures of Providence, Rhode Island. And so I didn't want to include that, okay? And for me, providence actually as a believer in Jesus Christ is that there are things that have happened in my life that I can't explain. People that I've run across, opportunities about research programs or opportunities for collaboration that never even crossed my mind and it's just a simple meeting. I uh, just happened to meet somebody, you know, uh, in the line at Starbucks, just uh, happened to be there at 11.30 at night with another attending physician writing notes and get into discussions about uh, where, where did we even start that then lead to collaborations and opportunities to pursue um, areas of research, uh, professional opportunities, uh, expanding the scope of interactions 
and influence. And I think providence is all a part of our lives, whether you call it luck or coincidence or whatever. There are some things that happen in your life that just allow things to happen and things to move forward for you. An example of scientific providence, I think, is Dr. Griff Rogers' discovery that hydroxyurea, which is basically an anti-cancer agent, actually um, increases fetal hemoglobin. And that was kind of a providential discovery that hydroxyurea could actually impact fetal hemoglobin. But it's been a major therapeutic advance in sickle cell disease. So I think that you always have to be open to and look for providence in your relationships, at work, you know, in your experiments, at the bench. Don't throw away all those things that um, the answer to your scientific hypothesis was no, because maybe there is a providential answer in there um, in the no answer, that if you dig a little deeper and maybe ask a few more questions, you might get additional novel insights. Number five is purpose. I think they're all tied together. Love that. Got purpose. Well, you know, again, your passion is tied to your purpose. If you don't really know what your purpose is, if you don't have a sense of what you really, really want to do, and purpose can change, but purpose is... Uh, is, is what allows you to direct and target and fuel that passion that you may have. And I think that it's really, really important to um, identify and focus on what your purpose is and build that story. And purpose can have multiple chapters in your life because everybody has seasons in their life, you know? My purpose when I was in med school was, especially my first year of med school at Duke, where they crammed the first two years into one year, and during Black October, we had 18 exams in 30 days. It was just like, get me through the next 30 days. Sometimes that's what the purpose is. Um, there are different seasons of purpose. If you are early in your career, trying to balance and juggle the work-life balance between family and your career obligations and aspirations and, and, and what you want to do. Um, but purpose is, again, a great focuser of passion. And it's my fifth P. On to the C. The Cs are challenges. Um, when you have passion, when you have purpose, when you have perspective, it doesn't matter what you set your mind to or your heart to do. The issue is, is that once you do that, automatically there are going to be challenges. There's not a day, not a minute, not an hour, not a week or a year where there's the potential for challenges. Um, sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're small. Um, they come in every flavor and shade of the rainbow, shape and size. But no matter what the challenge, um, the issue is, is I love the final sticky note where the impossible challenges that everyone has faced, and I'm sure from our panelists we're going to hear, and from even members of this audience, there have been challenges that people have faced in their health in terms of getting your long-awaited first in human therapeutic cancer vaccine made under a contract QC'd under contract through a thousand page FDA IND after three or four years of begging for funds to finally being able to treat people who are resisting very advanced stages of metastatic cancer. That there are times when the challenges really do seem impossible and you just have to be persistent, keep at it, keep slugging at it, and eventually the impossible does become possible. And as a matter of fact, what I love to say is, is that everything that you see and everything that we deal with at one time was unseen. Every single thing that exists. Because at one time, it was in somebody's mind. And if you just want to go retro about 20 years, get a movie from 1980, night, early 1990s, and take a look at the cell phones, they look like a big Timberland boot. 
you know, that the guy is holding up to his head. And now in 2015, everybody has a video camera, an audio recorder, a camera, a GPS. They can do their stocks. They can do their email, their phone. They can do selfies. I mean, it's like all the tricks and twists. Who knows? But that was all an impossibility. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, everything that we see now was an impossibility yesterday. And the evidence that it's possible is that we have it now. So that's the issue with challenges. Number two is choices. Um, you know, there are many career turns and career paths that we can make, choices that we make. Which protocol am I going to do? Who am I going to work with? Where am I going to go? Where, where am I going to do my postdoctoral fellowship? Um, you know, what's going to be my subspecialty? Where am I going to do my medical training? How am I going to license? How long am I going to stay here? There, there are always choices that we have. I saw the middle sign because there have been choices that I've been faced with where I felt like my brain was saying, exit now, stage left, do not pass go, do not collect $200. This isn't going to work out. It's impossible. But in the end, the thing that's absolutely incredible about us as human beings and free moral agents, you know, dogs got to bark, fish got to swim, birds got to fly. But we get to choose <laughs> what we do in life and with our lives, which is really, really very, very incredible. And the environment of the NIH and the research environment of the NIH really makes for some very, very incredible professional choices, both personally and professionally. Number three C is collaboration. I love this because it was like, again, Google Images. I just like whipped this up and they're even matching. And you know, it's like everybody's got their different little cog in the wheel. And the important thing is, and I think the other perspective about considering all the perspectives that people can bring culturally, from a gender perspective, from an ethnicity perspective, from a professional discipline perspective, is, is that everybody can supply a perspective. And there's actually a chink in the wheel that connects to something else. And the issue is, is when people bring in their wheels, that's what actually makes things move forward. Because whether it's a big wheel or a small wheel, that's how progress is made. And the, the right-hand side of the slide, I just love the different popsicle flavors of the path that you're walking on. But ultimately, that pan-person effort, when it's targeted and people are in agreement and actually kind of start thinking single-mindedly about how we can address this problem, it's amazing how quickly things can move forward. It really is. Um, a simple example that's really not noble or anything like that is, is that a couple of years ago on New Year's Eve, New York City got like two and a half feet of snow, some, some, some incredible amount. It was like two feet within the two days before New Year's Eve. And I don't know, a million people come to Times Square. And what was amazing is in less than 20 hours, Times Square was clean as a whistle so there could be a New Year's Eve blast party. Now, if we could get people in Congress to agree about you know, budgets and funding and so forth that quickly within 24 hours, I mean, gosh, wouldn't that be incredible? But that's just an example of how, you know, everybody coming in and being focused on something singularly minded can make absolutely phenomenal things happen in a really short period of time. Number four is my colleagues. You know, I love the Rubik's Cube because it's like we're all like twisting around trying to figure out the puzzles of the questions that we're trying to answer scientifically, trying to help each other get to the top, you know, pulling up the rope. I love the middle thing that said promotions are good, bonuses are better, but working with a colleague like you is the best part of this job. And I will have to say that after 27 years at the NIH, 
it is really the opportunity to work with some of the most compassionate, talented, dedicated, brilliant, brightest people on the planet that has kept me at the NIH. And um, it's allowed me to remain and to stay despite the challenges that have remained. And colleagues in the world get bigger and bigger. You start out with a small world of colleagues, but it's amazing. Um, there's less than six degrees of separation. And uh, the collaborations scope across institutions, across institutes, across countries, across the globe and the planet. And it really makes for a very rewarding life. The final C is the conquest. I mean, that's the reason why we're here. It is the raison d'etre for why we do what we do, um, to ultimately be a part of research that really impacts human health and makes a difference in the lives of people who are resisting health challenges, even, even unto death. They are literally fighting for their very lives. And that's what the focus of our research is about, is, is that conquest. But I put two pictures there because um, when you get to the mountaintop and you actually go, aha, we did it. An example for me professionally is my uh, involvement with uh, work in the early study of antiretroviral agents and immune-based therapies for HIV infection in pediatric and adolescent and young adult patients. I mean, when I was in med school, there was no such thing as AIDS or HIV. In the latter years of med school, during my professional lifetime, were the first descriptions of the virus when I was doing my residency. Bob Gallo and Luke Montagnier and colleagues here identified HIV as the cause of AIDS, and then we had a blood test, but it was a death sentence. It was an absolute death sentence. And then there was a little bit of providence because a few investigators took some old, beat up, bust, no end, not working, anti-cancer drugs called zidovudine off the shelf and said, hey, let's pour it in there, see if it keeps the virus from growing. And voila, reverse transcriptase inhibitors were born. And it led to our first initial early studies of reverse transcriptase inhibitors and then subsequent classes of drugs and then the protease inhibitors and combinations of drugs and ultimately therapeutic advances such that HIV infection and AIDS was transformed from a death sentence to a life sentence. It's a chronic illness in 2015. There are therapeutic interventions. We used to be giving people pills, you know, every four hours, 25, 30, 50 pills a day. Now, three or four medicines in a single pill once a day. It's amazing what we can do when we get to the conquest. But the issue is, is if you get there alone, it's really not worth it. When you get to your mountaintop, you really need to make sure that there are other people that are there with you because a conquest achieved alone is really not a successful conquest at all. So those are the five Ps. You got the five Cs. Here's the last and final T, which is thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you. Excuse me, I do have another thing to do. I actually have the privilege of introducing Laura Lee, who is going to be the moderator for our panel and introduce the panel. Laura Lee, I mean, talk about somebody who has been marathoning for many years regarding this incredible enterprise that is the NIH Clinical Center. Um, it's amazing what you've done. And um, it's really a privilege to be able to introduce Laura, who is the Special Assistant to the Deputy Director for Clinical Care and Patient Safety and Clinical Quality at the NIH Clinical Center. Um, 
Those of us in the know know that she's been David Henderson's right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, <laughs> extra head. <laughs> and um, uh, she has been an integral part of the success of this institution. So Laura, it's your go. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Wood, for that kind um, introduction and an amazingly inspirational talk. And um, Dr. Clayton for including me in this exciting and very important event as we celebrate Women's Health Week here at the National Institutes of Health. I sort of feel like I'm with a, a group of old, or whether I should, probably should just say long-term friends and colleagues. Because, <laughs> right, thank you, I know it's much better. Because I've known several of the women on the stage for many, many years. And happily now, I can add several new women of stature to my circle. And for that, I'm very grateful to everybody um, here in the room to let me do that. I was pleased when uh, Dr. Clayton and Bonnie uh, asked me to moderate today's event. I've known Dr. Clayton for well over a decade. In fact, my first and very most favorite memory of Dr. Clayton when, was when she was a young investigator, or rather a younger investigator, because I swear the woman does not age, uh, with the National Eye Institute. She was presenting a scientific poster at a research event here at the Clinical Center, and with her, standing at the poster, was her amazingly elegant mother. And what struck me most about that day was how unabashedly proud each of them was of the other. It was just two women genuinely leaning in, and I'll never forget that image. It's, I've carried it with me for a decade. And here today, we have a stage filled with women who are each making remarkable contributions to science, to patient participant experience, and to the health of our nation and our world. I came to the Clinical Center, like many of the people on the stage, um, 30 short years ago, nearly 30 short years ago, as a relatively new nurse, uh, not exactly knowing what to expect of this research institution. But I've learned several important lessons over those ensuing years. First, our care team members here at the Clinical Center are the most dedicated professionals I know. They possess the rare ability to provide compassionate and safe patient-centric care while seamlessly managing the requirements of complex clinical research studies. Second, our investigators, who are responsible for saving and improving the lives of countless people, do what they do so well in the faces of ever-mounting pressures and demands. And finally, and most importantly, our patient participants, who come here from all over the world to volunteer for one of nearly, one of nearly 1,500 clinical research studies ongoing at the Clinical Center, are truly genuine heroes. I've also learned in my work here at the Clinical Center that the delivery of safe and effective care and the conduct of high quality science is truly a team sport. We simply can't do the work we do without the engagement of our patients. The theme of this year's National Women's Health Week is the faces of clinical research beyond inclusion. And whereas many of us in this room equate the term inclusion with assuring that our research studies have the appropriate representation from diverse patient populations, which is truly important, important I encourage, no actually I think I challenge you to broaden your thinking about inclusion to inc include the active and deliberate engagement of our patient participants, our heroes, in all aspects of their care and research. Imagine how care and science would be improved if patient participants were engaged early in the design of protocols to assure that their physical, emotional, and social needs were taken into consideration way upstream in the research process. Their research experience most assuredly would be improved leading ultimately to better scientific outcomes. Or imagine how we could reduce errors and harm in the hospital setting if our patients were actively engaged as members of clinical center committees and teams that were working on critical patient safety and quality issues. And finally, one can only imagine that our collective sense of partnership would be enhanced if patients were engaged even after their studies concluded by routinely providing information to them about the outcomes of the studies in which they participated. Just imagine, three simple shifts in our thinking can lead to better patient participant experiences as well as better science. So, collectively, let's meet that challenge, and there's no better way to get started than to meet the women that can make that happen. So let's welcome our <laughs> professionals and our volunteers. I'll do the introductions. Um, so I will ask that you raise your hand or wave when, since we're not sitting in any sort of order that I have in my book, so we weren't that organized. So our first uh, clinical trial volunteer is Jamie Gentilly. 
Jamie was infected with HIV at age three through a blood transfusion during open heart surgery. She joined her first trial protocol, drug trial protocol at NIH in 1990 and has gone and since gone on to lead a happy and healthy life. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biobehavioral Health and a Master's degree in Public Health. Jamie works as a senior manager at a children's hospital, excuse me, in Northern Virginia and lives in Reston with her husband of nine years. In 2013, she published her memoir, and you've got to listen to the title of this book, Surviving HIV, Growing Up a Secret and Being Positive. She remains part of the NIH family through her involvement in a longitudinal study focusing on HIV's long-term effects. Welcome, Jamie. Our next volunteer is Juliana Adjadobi. Juliana and her younger brother, Paul, were two children out of seven that were born with sickle cell anemia in her family. In 2010, both Juliana and Paul learned about the bone marrow transplant research program at the NIH. Unfortunately, prior to becoming an active participant, Paul passed away from sickle cell disease earlier the same year. After the successful completion of her transplant, Juliana made the conscious decision to trade the life of a certified public accountant for the life of a registered nurse. Woohoo! Wow. <laughs> Sorry about the income drop, though, I would say. <laughs> anyway, Juliana just completed her first year as a registered nurse in a med surge unit at a community hospital and hopes to work with children in the near future. Juliana plans to remain an active participant in the NIH sickle cell research team and hopes to be a positive influence and role model for future participants. So welcome, Juliana. Our other volunteer, Sue Scott, is unable to be here today, but we'd like to thank her for uh, agreeing to volunteer, and hopefully she'll be, be able to join us in, in the future sometime. So let's move on to the professionals that are in our panel. Dr. Amina White is a faculty member in the Department of Bioethics. Amin, uh, Amina's work focuses on the study of ethical challenges among physicians during training and in clinical practice when caring for vulnerable patient populations while handling office pressures and time constraints. Her research includes patient-physician communication in the era of electronic health records, patient activation and engagement of disadvantaged or marginalized patient groups, and trauma-informed practices and obstetrics and gynecology for women who disclose a history of abuse. Dr. White also studies issues related to the inclusion of pregnant women in clinical research. Welcome, Dr. White. In addition to her role as the chief of the Clinical Center Social Work Department, Adri Dr. Adrienne Farrar, who is, by the way, retiring soon, and I will never forget six weeks, not that she's counting, and I will never <laughs> forgive her for that, um, is the member of the clinical, is, in addition to her work as a social work chair, is um, a member of the Clinical Center's Bioethics in Committee and Consultation Team. Her areas of interest are social work ethics and moral action in healthcare and social work administration in healthcare. Throughout her career, she has held social work positions in public and private sectors of geriatric social work and healthcare. Prior to joining NIH, Dr. Farrar was the director of the social work department at the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. She's a member of the National Association of Social Workers, a board member of the Association of Healthcare Social Workers, Metro D.C. Inc., and a member and former board member of the National Society for Social Work Leadership in Healthcare. Welcome, Adrian. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Lori Wiener joins us. Joins us. Lori is the co-director of the Behavioral Health Corps and director of the Psychosocial Support and Research Program at the National Cancer Institute here at as an intramural program. In this role, Dr. Wiener developed a robust clinical and research program that has focused on critical clinical issues in the HIV field, including parental needs and coping, children's distress, fathers' experiences, diagnosis, disclosure and loss and bereavement. She also has been active in helping to manage our pediatric oncology patients, studying areas, areas such as lone parenting, transnational parenting, emotional consequences of medically required isolation, sibling donor experiences, graft versus host disease, distress screening, and end of life planning. She has also dedicated a substantial part of her career to applying knowledge from her clinical experience in psychosocial studies to creating innovative resources such as workbooks and games for adolescents and young adults. Welcome, Lori, and our panel. So as Janine said, this is going to be a conversation. 
So I have a few questions to ask our panelists, but I really do encourage anybody that has a question or wants to be involved, please don't hesitate to go to the, the microphones and we're happy to call on you. And we really do want this to be a discussion um, amongst the, our friends. So I, I think I'll start with our clinical volunteers, clinical trials volunteers, and simply ask the question to have you briefly describe to us why you decided to participate in a research study here or at the clinical center or elsewhere. And either Juliana or Jamie, whoever would like to go first. I know you're not shy. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't as much of an active participant in the decision to come here as it was my only choice. And back when I was diagnosed with HIV when I was eight, um, after realizing that I was infected at age three, hang on, is this working? Yeah. Um, there were no um, treatment options for kids with HIV at all. Um, and it was literally a death sentence. And the doctor told my family, she's got two years to live. And miraculously, two years later, um, we got the news that NIH was opening up a study, a clinical trial for pediatric patients living with HIV. So it was really, um, it was serendipitous. It was providence. Providence. <laughs> it's providence. <laughs> it absolutely was. Um, and it, were, it was no decision for my family because it was the only piece of hope and, um, and any kind of vision for any kind of future that I might have. So I was 10, so I did what my parents told me to do. And <laughs> they did consider, you know, is this going to be a life that will be good for her? It's a lot of clinic time. It's a lot of tests and procedures. Um, so they certainly considered that. But, um, but it was really, it was a miracle that came what, exactly when I needed it. Um, I guess <clears throat> for me, it was more of a, I was just tired of living with sickle cell anemia. It just was not a very productive life. And I just wanted more for me and my brother. But, you know, they, there are many things, you know, you have family members. I'm originally from Nigeria, so... You know, with Africans, we're just like, you know, you got to try this or this or, you know, you pray and everything and drink this. So, but none of those worked. And I just got, you know, just tired of it. So I just kind of accepted that's the way it is. But one day, it was just so funny. I was just coming back from work because this was when I was an accountant. And one of my friends gave me a number to, um, uh, some, uh, to a nurse at Howard um, University Hospital, and she said, I just call her that she heard about this research that they do at NIH. I'm like, okay, sure, I'll do that. So I kept the number, and that same day, I went to visit my parents, and my mom was on the phone with another, of one of my aunts who was telling my mom about, you know, this girl that uh, was, had sickle cell disease, and she went through the trial, and she's much better now. So my mom was like, oh, you have to talk to you know, this person, I'm like, mom, okay, sure, whatever. So I took the phone and my aunt gave me the number and I wrote down the name and the number and I'm like, okay, thank you. So when I went home, I took from my pocket the same number um, that my mom, my mom's friend, my aunt gave me and then the same, and then the other pocket, the um, number, the information that my friend from work gave me and it was identical. It, was, it just told me to contact this same nurse with the same number. And I'm like, okay, if this is not a <laughs> sign, then I'm really dumb. So exactly, Providence. So I'm like, okay, well, this is, I have to do this. So that then I contacted the lady and that's how they got me in touch with um, Beth Link and Dr. Shea's group at NIH. So, and then we just went from there. Great, good, thank you so much. I just want to talk a little about this concept of engagement. So we did a, a study um, of research participants' perception of their, their research experience. And one of the findings from that um, survey study was that participants and patients who felt that they were active members of the research team had a way better overall perception of their clinical research experience. Um, can either of you, or both of you would be great, to comment on your feeling of engagement, your feeling of being a partner in the team, and if it happened, what that meant to you. If it didn't happen, what that meant to you and how you think you could um, 
maybe get two things differently. Same as you, Justin. <laughs> One thing. Um, I think that as I grew up in the clinical trial setting, my level of engagement evolved. Um, being a kid when I started, it was not quite as involved as my parents were involved in the in the process, and they were making the informed decisions. Um, as I got older and I started to sit down and look at the protocols before we signed them, then I got more into it, and it was fascinating to me that all of this had gone into what they were doing in the research setting. Um, and I remember, Dr. Wood, you might remember this. Uh, we were sitting and talking over a new protocol that was coming up that was very promising. And I think I was 14 or 15, and I got so overwhelmed that I started crying. And it was the first time that I was really involved in my own care. And you might think that that's a bad thing, but it wasn't. It was good because it opened my eyes to this is my life and I can have some say in it and some autonomy in it. And from that point on, I really did become a more active participant and it made it an engaging experience for me and for my family. And um, it kind of goes along with the philosophy that my mom raised me under is advocate for yourself, advocate for your kids. Um, so that became, um, kind of how I continued on the journey at NIH. Um, and then I, you know, I think when I was younger and um, we, my parents were the ones making, primarily making the decisions, I think there may have been times that they would have wanted to have been more involved in the process, um, to be very honest. And I think that it had to do with competing priorities of research and the needs of the patient. And I, you know, looking back in retrospect, I think there could have been um, some better, more engaging conversations that could have been had with them. Um, but for me, it was always a positive experience. Thank you. Um, for me, it was, it was very easy. Um, I didn't, it wasn't something that I had to fight for, for my voice to be heard. But the team that I worked with, they were just wonderful. You know, they were very caring and they made sure that they took the time to make sure that, um, you know, my needs were met or my concerns were uh, addressed and my questions were answered. And and I guess it's, you know, the way I look at it, it's I'm not doing this. You know, for me, getting the transplant wasn't just for me. It was also for my brother. So whatever, you know, whatever I was trying to, um, at times I was just like, okay, is this really going to work right after my transplant? I was like, okay. Because I was told that it may work or it may not work. You just don't know. But regardless, I just went for it. And, but I think just I had to remain positive. I was very, um, like, I'll get discouraged thinking, okay, it's been a year and I'm still getting sick. I'm getting more blood transfusions than I was getting before. But I just hung in there. My family was very supportive and the team, they were very supportive. And I guess, you know, it's, it just came naturally. So the more, as time went by, I started getting better and better. And then I just started, you know, getting more and more involved. And I think last year they asked me to do this little um, snippet about, you know, my experiences as a transplant um, uh, volunteer. And I, you know, I didn't even hesitate. I was like, yeah, I would love to do that. I mean, whatever I can contribute to make it you know, known to other people out there about sickle cell anemia, or also to educate you know, the world about this disease, um, I was all for it. So for me, it, it wasn't something that was any challenge, and it, was, it just came, it came really easy for me, so. Interesting, great. And could the, um, I can call you the professionals, but I'll, I'll say the, <laughs> NI, the, the NIHers. Could you each comment about sort of your role in terms of engaging, how, how you see your role engaging patients in the research and their care to make sure that they do have that voice. Um, these are two very wonderful women who clearly have their voices, but I'm sure that you in each of your roles at the social work, you see you um, run up against patients that may not um, have that voice. Lori, do you want to start? Sure. It's a critical issue, and there is an emerging field of what we call patient reported outcomes right now, where we want to be able to make sure that the patient's voice is heard, so that even for symptoms of um, pain, fatigue, anxiety, sadness, we're not just asking the parent, 
about how the child is feeling. We'll ask that as well, but we'll be able to make sure that we have the child's voice as well from throughout the treatment um, and their time here. You know, and NPR this morning on my way to my hour and a half commute to work, uh, there was a piece on stroke and depression. And the reporter um, quoted a position, I got it in the middle of this, that there's no health without mental health. And so it's truly the way that I've practiced, that the child's mental health is critical, the family's mental health is critical. And if we don't address that, you're not gonna have adherence, you're not gonna have people who are gonna be participating, you're not gonna have people who will be functioning well. The challenge in pediatrics is when to involve and engage the child. And for some, we really have to respect the family because every family is different and every family comes in with their own norms and beliefs. We work with families to be able to help them to be able to provide some more autonomy to their child, and especially as they become teenagers, to be able to work with transition issues so that they could be able to transition into adult care. When you have a child with a chronic illness, that often becomes difficult. Families are very involved. Sometimes people will perceive them as being over-involved. They may have almost lost their child on numerous occasions, and so they watch everything. Unfortunately, sometimes the child then doesn't become prepared to have their own voice and make their own decisions. So we're very cognizant of that, but also respectful of families' choices um, and decisions. Um, well, the issue of patient engagement and voice is such an important one we take very seriously here at the NIH. And so the Department of Bioethics um, is part of a, a service, offers a service that can help participants who lack the ability to consent to research make sure that their needs and um, um, safety is really protected if they are in fact participating in a research study. So for example, I am a member of the ability to consent assessment team and you know, there are studies that are ongoing here at the NIH that involve patients with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And um, sometimes the investigators aren't quite sure if the person who is a potential research subject, number one, understands what's going on with the study and, and some of the risks and the benefits of participating. Um, and number two, that you know, if they have any reservations, about joining the study that they either can decide for themselves how they feel about the different components or that they have an appropriate surrogate decision maker to, um, to help think through some of those issues and make sure that at the end of the day, research participation is in the benefit of that individual or other individuals who can be helped by the research. And so we take that very, very seriously. And uh, we conduct things called capacity assessments of individual potential participants, and also um, have conversations with family members uh, who may be serving as surrogate decision makers to make sure that we really respect people's choices um, and their overall well-being as they participate in the studies here. So in the social work department, I wear a few hats because we have a few programs under our uh, umbrella the social work program. We are also responsible for the language interpreters program and for, for the volunteer program. So we, I have to pay attention to um, the voices of patients from a number of different perspectives. Um, what's interesting is in, in our social work world or in our training, listening and observing are very important skills to our practice. Uh, it's very important for us to listen to what the patient is saying, to observe their behavior um, in terms of what they are doing and how their families are doing, and many, many times to help them interpret as well as for us to interpret to the rest of the team what they're feeling, what they're actually saying. Uh, the message that patients often give to their healthcare providers, whether it's a doctor or a nurse, um, the, they could be very, two very different messages, and by the time we see them, there might be a third message. 
Uh, and so it's very important that we continually engage um, with the team and with the families and the patients to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of understanding what that patient is actually saying. The other, the, re the, the reason why the language interpreters are important to this process also is because their role is not just to interpret what's being said, but they have a, a profound knowledge of the culture of the individuals that they are working with. And they're able to do what's called in their profession cultural brokering, which again helps us to understand where the individual patients are coming from, as well as how they view healthcare, how they view involvement with healthcare professionals. And again, just because we're uh, highly empowered um, American citizens who know what we want and have no problem with asking <laughs> for those kinds of things, that, that is not the case with many, many other cultures. Uh, physicians and nurses are revered. Uh, they are not challenged. What they say goes. And so it is our job as the interpreter, as well as the social worker, to make sure it's under that the the team understands where this patient is coming from and how we can work together to empower them to have a voice. So those are the couple of areas that we come from. Adrian, would you mind life. commenting? Last year, we had really the honor of bringing a cohort of a family from Uganda to uh, for a study here. And it was a great opportunity not only to um, include these folks in a research study, but it was certainly a different perspective for us as an organization um, dealing with language issues and culture. Do you want to just comment a little about some of the barriers or some of the, the bumps in the road we, we met with that experience and how we, have resource, we had resources here to meet that? Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, as you well know, there was a tremendous amount of preparation uh, within the Institute to, for a number of patients who mostly belong to one of two families, mm -hmm. about 10 or 12. Yeah individuals who came. Uh, and so the institute had done quite a bit of work. At the point when they knew for sure that they were coming, they engaged the clinical center in working with them. Um, but not in en enough time for uh, the, the language interpreters program to find the interpreters for this very specific language that they spoke uh, in, their, in their culture. The language was Acholi. Uh, there's a sort of sister or brother language called Luo. Um, they seem to understand um, each other, but we didn't know until we recruited some interpreters that there are little turf issues between the Acholi <laughs> speakers yeah. in Uganda and the Luo speakers in Uganda. And so even as we brought in the interpreters, we had to make assure the family members that the individuals who were interpreters were not hostile to them. So how would we have known this? We had no way of knowing it unless we were open, listened to what was being said uh, by the interpreter with regards to the questions that were being asked of him. Who's your father? What did he do? Where did he live? So that he, it was clear. So that was game on yeah. <laughs> is what. And you all did a, right. the whole team did a remarkable right. job. So it was, that was it's that kind of ground up, not, not even to mention the fact that the patients who came here and their families didn't have proper clothing, had no shoes to get on an on a airplane. Um, we didn't know what they ate. We had to investigate all those kinds of things. Uh, and they were here for a couple of weeks. Uh, and so uh, it, it was a very intense period of my life and I hopefully won't ever have to go through that again. <laughs> in, the <next laughs> in the next six weeks, in by the, the way. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Great, yeah. And I, I think that it, it was a great example about how this place can really garner those resources to meet a really challenging and very vulnerable patient population. So I want to go, I, these guys sort of had some questions ahead of time, but I'm going to go off script a bit just hearing. So could Jamie, could you talk to us a little about the process of writing your book? and where that came from, because I just, A, love the title and, and just intrigued by your journey with that. Sure, absolutely. Yes, I shamelessly brought some here in case anyone <laughs> um, I, when my journey of HIV started out 
as the book says, as a big secret that we couldn't talk about, we didn't tell friends about, we told only close, immediate family members. Um, we, at that point, had moved to a small town in Pennsylvania, and um, it just wasn't something that you talked about. So <laughs> it was a secret, and as I grew up, I kind of wanted to be more open with my friends. You form great friendship friendships in high school and college, so at the end of high school, I decided I want to tell people about this. I want people to know that HIV exists in our world and that you have to be careful. Um, so I had a school assembly the day before graduation that um, no one knew what it was for, and it, we were doing graduation rehearsal, rehearsing, walking in a line, and <laughs> my friends and I went to Hardy's for lunch, and they were like, we have to go back to school for this rehearsal, That's this or for this um, auditorium assembly. What is this? I'm like, I don't know. What a drag. So <laughs> we, get, we get back and I like sneak back behind stage and I give my presentation and it was strategically done right before graduation in case they came at me with pitchforks and I had to leave town. So I was going to college so I could safely escape and I was the youngest kid in the family so they could escape if they needed to. Um, but thankfully it went amazingly well. So that was my first kind of experience of talking in public about this and, and being open about it and it developed more and more in college and I became more comfortable in my own skin and um, decided that I could be op open with this with people that I met. Um, and then going into the working world and find meeting um, my now husband Paul was really the turning point for me that I, I found somebody who will willingly take this on and deal with this for the rest of their life. My family didn't have a choice. They're stuck with it. I don't have a choice. I'm stuck with it. But this guy is making a conscious decision to spend his life with me. So from that point on, that gave me such a, uh, I think that really improved my confidence and just helped define me as a person that I felt so much more comfortable with being HIV positive and talking to people about it. So at that point, I, I kind of got this idea of I want to write my stories down. I've had all these amazing experiences at NIH. There's a, there's a lot about NIH in the book, and it's all positive. Um, oh, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I decided, you know, even if it's just for my niece and nephew, <coughs> excuse me, to see the story of their aunt, I just wanted to get it on paper and start writing it. So I wrote when I felt like writing. I didn't force myself to write when I didn't feel like writing. And it took me about three years start to finish. And I didn't do it chronologically. I wrote about when I was a teenager when I w wanted to write about that. Um, so it was a pretty organic and slow process for me. And as it came about, um, I really realized that it might have the potential to help other people and um, help the field of research and healthcare. So. Um, when I published it, I self-published it through Amazon. Um, it was kind of the, <laughs> the, you talked about this with the disclosure, like you, you can't rewind. Once you get it out there, <laughs> you, can't, you can't get stuff off the internet, people. So <laughs> it, it was, it, when, when I submitted it, I was like, your book is now for sale. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it was, um, so that was kind of the, the uh, another moment of, ah, this is a new step and so far so good. Um, but after after that, it's been I've been able to do things like this, which I realize is is what I'm really really passionate about, um, and I'm so grateful to have something in my hand that I can hold and say this is my story. And I I recommend it for anyone. It doesn't matter what your story is. It's there's such a cathartic process of writing it out and um, processing through things and remembering things that I had forgotten about, and it comes back so clearly. Oh my gosh, I remember that day at NIH when the nurse was Batman. And it really, <laughs> it was so therapeutic and so cathartic. Um, and it's really something that I'm proud of uh, to have as kind of a little piece of my story so far. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been one of my greatest accomplishments and I feel very proud of it. Um, and it's, I, I do like the idea that I can pass it on to people. They can read it. My niece and nephew can read it. So my, uh, my nephew, who's now 11, uh, read the title. He's like, Surviving Hiv. <laughs> 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 so, so they're learning all about this stuff from the get-go. It's been, I've, I feel very grateful for the process, and um, yeah, I, I feel very grateful for that entire process. Great. Thanks for sharing that. 
And Juliana, can you talk with us about your decision to leave the world of business and go into uh, the world of healthcare and how just your experience here also may have influenced that? I never wanted to work in the business world. <laughs> I really didn't. I wanted to be a nurse, really, from the get-go. But unfortunately, I couldn't. And again, African parents, you, ha you have like four or five choices. Doctor, lawyer, nurse. Um, what else? Uh, like, and yeah, doctor, lawyer, nurse, accountant, and that's it. Anything else, don't even come. Don't even like <laughs> step foot and say, hey, Dad, I think I want to be a dancer or an artist. <laughs> no. You, you can't do that. So the other, you know, the first three were out. So the only one was, I guess, you know, an accountant. So I guess, you know, the way they looked at it, I could sit down and, you know, work and nothing, not running up and down, wasting my energy and stuff like that. So I went into the accounting world. Um, but as time went by, it's just, I thought it will, things may get easier, but it didn't. I just found myself having to, work four or five times harder than the next person because by March or February, um, by March or April, I'm done with all my vacation, I'm done with all my sick leave because it's spent in the hospital. And I'll see my mates getting promoted and then I was just stagnant. And then the next thing I know, they, I get, um, they downsizing, I get laid off. Of course, it's very hard to prove that it's, you know, to prove that the reason why they, you know, I'm getting, I was getting fired or getting laid off was simply because of my illness. But um, so it was something that I accepted. And but as I grew older and older, then I went back to school, got my master's in taxation, and I'm like, okay, now at least maybe I'll get some more respect, you know, like it's more of a managerial job. But then again, sickle cell anemia doesn't care, you know, it just comes at any time. The thing with this illness, it's it's un very unpredictable. You can do everything right, and then one day you're just happy-go-lucky, and then the next thing you know, you're screaming in pain. And then you're in the hospital for days and weeks. And um, so I, I remember even like when I was in suburban hospital, because that was the main place where I went, I'll have like one arm strapped to, you know, transfusion, I'll be getting blood transfusion. And then the other hand, three, you know, me and my um, laptop trying to do tax returns, you know, <laughs> because, because if I didn't get, you know, get the tax returns done, you know, I had a deadline to meet. And my nurses, they're like, oh, my gosh, how could you do this? You know, you need to rest, you know. But I'm like, yeah, but then who's going to pay the bill? You know, I understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, I have to make a living. You know, I have to, you know do the things that I have to do because the next thing I know, if I don't do this, I'm going to be fired or laid off. So that was pretty much my life. Um, I'll come in, you know, to work three, four weeks, I'm good, and then the next week I'm out, and then the next thing I know, I was getting laid off. So it was just like that. And finally, it was until, you know, the story I told you guys earlier, how I came to, you know, NIH and everything. So that happened, and I was so excited. And my, you know, I, I told my brother about it. We were like, we were just like, oh my gosh, this is the turning point. That if this thing does actually work, it's just a life changer. And it's funny because um, we told my siblings. I have uh, seven brothers. I'm um, six brothers and sisters. So it was five of them that had to go in and get tested. And each one, of course, you know, they were like all four. They went in, and they were not match. Everyone went in, not match. So we got four no matches. And then finally, my older sister went. And I was at work, and then um, Beth Link called me, and she was like, okay, I got the news for Francisco. That's my older sister that went in. And I'm like, so what is it, no match? She's like, no, actually, she matched you. I'm like, wait, are you kidding me? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, not only that, she also matched your brother. And I'm like, what? So it was just the turning point. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this, okay, this is it. There's, this is a big sign. And. My brother and I were so excited. We did everything. I told my boss that, you know, I just need a few months off to get the transplant done. And they were happy for me also, I thought. And then what happened was, you know, after, you know, I did all the preparations and everything, I got sick again. And then they told me that I had to come to work. 
So that Thursday, I checked out of Suburban Hospital, went back to work, and then they laid me off. They laid me off on Friday, and they said that you know they just gave me a stupid reason, didn't make any sense to me. And then I was like, okay. Then on Friday, I called my brother. I'm like, okay, Paul, I got laid off again. What should we do? He said, okay, you know what? We should fight this. Let's go see a lawyer. So we went on Friday to go see a lawyer. And then on Saturday, I got sick again. I went back to the suburban hospital. And then on Sunday, my brother was supposed to come by and see me. He didn't come back. And I'm like, what's going on? And then that following Monday, I'm like, where's Paul? Where's Paul? What's going on? And then that's when I heard the news that he passed away the day before. Mm. And that was just the turning point. Um, I'm like, okay. I'm done with the um, accounting world. That I didn't even want to go through with this um, transplant. I didn't see the point of it because I've lost my other half. I'm like, I can't do this without him. But then when I saw my mom and what it did to her and my dad, you know, they've lost a child. And here they are about to lose another one. And I just couldn't do that. I'm not a mother, but just looking at her, I can see that I could see that you know she was just you know she was just desperate she was she would do anything for me to go through this transplant and so because of that I decided to go through the transplant and then after the transplant it worked and I'm like okay you know what forget the accounting world I'm not going back <laughs> and then I said I made the conscious decision that I'm going to be an RN and Went back to school, did the accelerated program at Johns Hopkins, and a year and a half later, here I am. So, awesome. so. Thanks, both of you, for sharing that. Those stories, they're really amazing. Any questions from the audience? We'll take a look north just for a second and before we move on. <coughs> I have a question. Um, it sounds like neither of you were in placebo-controlled trials. Do you think your it would have been a different experience for you if you were? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Talk among yourselves. <laughs> for sickle cell anemia, I don't think there's a place for placebo. <laughs> You know, it was just because it was just one way. It's either you go through the transplant, hope, you know, hope to God that it works and you're cured or not because it's not an illness that you want to see, oh, if this person, you know, if this thing will work on this person or not. Because, you know what I mean? So for placebo, I don't think there's a place for it in terms of sickle cell anemia. Yeah, if it's a drug, then yeah, that's different. But this transplant thing, it's either or. You know what I mean? Hope that answers your question, but yeah, there's no place for placebo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. I've never really thought about it, actually. And I, I kind of along the same lines, even though it was a drug protocol, I can't really imagine it being a placebo go, going through that. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. White, would you like to weigh in on that from your perspective from an ethical standpoint and sort of? Um, the question of how participants who end up in the placebo arm of a trial might experience that is um, definitely an important question and um, a challenging one because part of what goes on in the consent process for placebo-controlled trials involves a discussion about um, the potential benefits of that trial and what randomization to one arm or another might mean. And it turns out that that's an incredibly difficult concept to describe in a way that is um, meaningful for people depending on the reason for which they are pursuing study participation. And it's even hard for the investigators to know that um, with confidence that somebody's not deceived into thinking that, you know, there's a technically a 50-50 chance uh, that they may end up in the, the arm with active uh, drug as opposed to the placebo arm, and yet to be able to conceptualize what it might mean if in fact you are in that placebo arm. It's, it's very challenging to study, uh, even through qualitative research, 
to get a sense of how people understand the concept of benefit. Um, and these are things that we are trying to tackle in the Department of Bioethics, for example. We have a number of uh, faculty members in our department who work on issues around consent and how potential participants understand that, how volunteers um, conceptualize randomization and how we can explain those things better so that people can actually make an informed decision that is meaningful for them uh, when there is a placebo-controlled trial. It's an excellent question, and it's one of the first questions that parents ask. Will my child be a guinea pig? Will there be a placebo? And for those who have become more educated, if it's gonna be a crossover study, so that there may be a placebo for a period of time, and then the study is crosses over. And it is a game changer um, for many parents and their pediatric patients. Lori, while you have the microphone in your hand, could you talk a little about the challenges of engaging pediatric participants in the research piece? I mean, it's one thing to engage them in their care, but to really engage them, like Jamie described, at the age 14, she then got engaged. Um, how do you engage younger kids, and do you engage younger kids in the research process? So, so that Lord we can have that broad yeah. range of inclusion. It's a really interesting question. It's one, engaging them in the research, but the other part is engaging them in their health care. For many children who grow up being sick, they don't really understand life differently than their life as it is. So over time, it's helping them to be able to comprehend and understand a little bit more what it is that they're living with so they can become then more engaged in the health care process. Um, there's ASCENT. And you know, Dr. White will be able to speak to this in more detail that most protocols have. So the children actually have a document that's written for their age and development um, that they could be able to go through to make sure that they understand what it is that they have to be able to go through. So in terms of the research, um, first from the parents' point of view and then for the children's, parents want to know, as we just said, is this gonna be safe? What are the benefits for my child? What are the risks for my child? Um, how much time will my child have to be away from school? What about psychologically? How will this impact them? And kids pick up from their parents. If a parent is stressed about a study or a protocol, as you remember this, the child's not gonna be comfortable participating in the clinical research. And the more stressed that the child seems to be, the more li unlikely a parent would wanna be is for, for their child to be able to continue to participate. The way everyone works very differently, and so in pediatrics, every child they see um, keeps their own book, and every time they come, they write a page. We have workbooks, so they may do a page of the workbook so that when they look back over time, they can be able to see what they went through at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, they may laugh at what their favorite color or favorite TV show was at that period of time and who their favorite family member or friend may be, but it's a journey that we try to be able to doc help them to be able to document so that they can understand over time, not only their illness, but how engaged that they wanna be. And for some, they become spokespersons. For some, they may wanna just forget about this period of time in their life. But um, engaging them from understanding their disease and then being able to then engage them in terms of making medical decision making is really a process that takes place as people age. Okay, thanks. Um, s switching over to, anybody have any other questions about around that regard? Okay, switching uh, gears a little to really focusing more on women's issues. And maybe, um, Amina, you could uh, field this one. From your perspective, why is it important, especially with all your work that you've done with women um, in your research, why it's important for women and women particularly of diverse backgrounds to participate in clinical research? Um, so, you know, we're here during this important week sort of recognizing some important gains that have been made in including women in research. And as Dr. Clayton actually mentioned right in the beginning, part of the reason that this is so important is actually a scientific one, and that is that um, women differ from men on a host of levels, all the way from, you know, um, physiology, the way metabolism works, um, hormonal differences, 
down to the level of the DNA. And to understand how a particular drug or therapy is going to affect certain kinds of people requires that those groups who are likely to use and benefit from that therapy be included in the development of the therapies and the testing of those therapies to make sure that you know, not only is a drug or intervention um, a safe one and an effective one, but at what dose? Questions like that can't be answered if you don't ask the questions and you don't have the perspective that includes groups that may be overlooked. Um, so, you know, now that we've made great strides in including women in the cohorts that are participating in, in uh, drug trials, there are additional challenges that we still need to um, sort of resolve and uh, improve in terms of including women of different diverse um, ethnicities in trials, which I'll say a little bit more about in a second, um, but also women at different stages of the life cycle. And uh, I really look forward to progress that's being made in that area. One of the issues that I am very passionate about as an obstetrician myself is the amount of research that we have yet to do to understand effective drugs and dosing for the entire population of pregnant women. That's a group that is very often left out of research uh, studies, really on account of trying to protect the safety of the developing fetus. Um, and yet, if we don't find a way to include women at that stage of life in studies around therapies that need women need, pregnant women get sick and need to have drugs that are well studied and effective and at the right dose to be effective. Um, without including them, we won't ever know and, and clinicians will not have appropriate evidence to make good decisions in, you know, in the hospital, in the outpatient practice when women do get sick. And around that issue of, of ethnic diversity, um, again, this is based on where people come from and their exposures. Um, there are changes at the level of DNA expression that we need to understand better so that groups, again, who are likely to benefit from uh, a particular intervention can with confidence know how a drug is likely to affect them and others in groups uh, in, in their, uh, their geographic or, or um, ethnic group. Great, thank you. Any questions from the, the audience? Morning. Morning. Uh, I'm Rebecca Goodwin. I work at the National Library of Medicine in one of our research divisions. Uh, and among the activities in which I participate, I'm uh, currently serving on our Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, subcommittee. And uh, first of all, just want to really uh, thank you all, all the panelists, for being here this morning. This has been a phenomenal, very informative session. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to invite any of you who are interested in doing so to comment about how uh, at various points and junctures in your journeys, uh, both personal and professional for all of you, uh, when you encountered challenges, uh, it would be interesting to hear about in hindsight what some of the information resources you feel would have been helpful to you at that time? I'm gonna take a stab at answering this. Um, I think what your question brings up, one of the biggest things that I'm passionate about and that I've learned from NIH is that there was no information resource, that we were the train tracks for the train that was just behind us. Um, I say we, because, you know. <laughs> um, but it, I, 
I think that that's why I think it's so important. It goes back to the purpose of why I want to be involved in this and why I think it's important to keep going with it is that there are some areas of study that don't have a resource to refer to yet. Um, so that's been my experience in kind of being on the front edge of HIV and kids and going from nothing to something. And then who knows where we're going to be in another 30 years. Um, so my biggest resource along that journey was my friend Lori here and my mom and support and um, supporting the psychosocial part of things as we started to navigate this very mysterious journey. For me, okay, I was told I was number 18, patient 18 of um, for the bone marrow transplant that I've done. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, where are the first 17, you know? <laughs> <laughs> where are they? Are they doing okay? Are they still, you know, alive and kicking? Can I meet them? Um, and I guess with HIPAA and everything, it's you know, there's just like this confidentiality thing. So it's really hard for you to get any information, you know. Um, and when I heard that, I was like, well, that's a little disappointing because I have so many questions, you know. There's so much that the doctors can give you. But I want to see someone that, you know, the actual participant that have been through this. I have my own questions. I was fortunate enough to meet, I think she was maybe patient number 15, and she came up, and she had uh, she had hers two years prior to mine, and she was doing really well. And she was kind of my greatest resource, you know. Unfortunately, she wasn't around enough, but, I mean, at least I got something from her. And um, I did meet another guy during one of my chemo sessions that I was having, but then, you know, but I, that was pretty much it. And he also told me that he would like if there was some kind of like a, I guess, support group, you know, that NIH had, you know, whereby the, you know, people that have been through this can come together. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, it would be really nice. But, you know, going back, it's like people, I don't know, maybe they don't want to be contacted or they just think, okay, there's no support group, therefore why should I bother? But for me, what I did, I told Dr. Shea and his group that, you know what, here's my number, here's my phone number. If whoever, you know, patient 20, 21, if they're coming in and they're interested, call me. I'll be more than happy to come in and talk to them. And I've done that for two other patients, you know, and they were so grateful that I was there, you know, as a resource for them. And I guess that's why I'm kind of doing this type of talks and um, these little sessions, because we really need to get the word out there. You know, it's not just you come in, I'm, I'm truly like, and I changed my life. It's This is a second life for me. And, you know, it, there are people out there that don't know about this. And word of mouth is the greatest, you know, is the best way to kind of to get the word out. But at the same time, if people don't know, you know, they don't know. So it's it's really, we should find a way to engage people that are, you know, the participants to kind of like keep in touch, you know, for future participants because that's the way, only way we can keep this thing going. Um, what I was going to say is um, in terms, part of your question sounded to me like as a colleague or as a professional, how does one stay in touch and in tune. Is that part of what you were asking as well? Yeah, I think that um, the organization that we're in um, supports and, and um, does quite a lot to kind of force us to, to really be engaged with our professional groups, um, whether they're local or um, or national or even international. I think that in terms of resources and where I look and have looked across my, my life, uh, in one way you could sort of come to NIH and, and think of yourself as sort of a, an island unto yourself. You know, we're on a, what, what we call either a campus or a reservation. Uh, we're, we're 
federal employees, and so there are not a lot of us in our professions in this environment, that kind of thing. Um, but because we are a learning environment, we're always looking for what's new, what's on the horizon, what are people doing that we're not doing here, what is it that we can tell other people about what we're doing here. So a huge resource for me across my career has, has have been the, the network of social workers in healthcare, whether they're local or national. We have the best library in the world, as far as I'm concerned, um, easy at your desk uh, access. Uh, so you can certainly get all the reading materials that you want or need. Um, we're, uh, because we're an academic environment, we have all the opportunity in the world to talk to our colleagues as well as other professions and professionals in the organization to continually learn. So I think the that's probably why I've been here as long as I have, because I, it's constantly an opportunity for stimulation. It's what you have to do to stay on top of your game, but it's also what the organization is about in many ways. And so I hear what you're saying um, in, in terms of needing the resources and how do you keep moving in those areas. So from a patient perspective, um, I can't agree more that the most important contact and resource is to be able to meet another patient. Um, for those patients that are um, quite able to be able to search the internet and they read some of the data and find that some of the patients have not survived, going into treatment is very, very scary. And because of HIPAA, that makes it challenging. But we work really hard to connect patients with patients if that's something that they want to be able to do, whether it's through support groups. Here is, it's challenging because people don't live close. They live in all over their world. So it's not like we could have a local group meet you Wednesday night. So we do a lot electronically. We have telephone support groups for kids, for siblings, for grandmothers, for grandfathers. You know, we have a bereavement group that meets monthly just to get through the first year. So we try to be able to keep those connections. Professionally, um, it could be a very lonely road. I agree and I don't agree. Um, Dr. Wood and I have spoken plenty about this. There are so many more resources now for women scientists, but there haven't always been. I've worked, you know, I live in two worlds. I'm trained as a social worker, but my, my work is really that as a clinical psychologist. And so the people that I've trained and are out there performing and, you know, um, in big jobs right now are psychologists because there haven't been, until more recently, social workers who are really trained in doing the kind of behavioral science research that we do here. So more resources could have been very helpful to get through the last 29 years. Um, but having colleagues like, you know, Dr. Wood and so many of the other people around here have made that possible. So I loved that slide <laughs> that you had up there. But for other professionals, because this is so important, part of my job, I've created something called the Pediatric Psycho-Oncology Professional website, where anyone who's involved in pediatric psycho-oncology can get on. It's through our own website, and they find out the newest articles, the newest resources, um, new conferences that are going up, new accreditations that are going up, job opportunities, fellowship opportunities, and we update it quarterly so that you know part of our job is to make that available to the rest of the world. So we make that very big world feel very small. And just to piggyback on everything you just said right. about <laughs> some of the professional challenges and the need for networking and sometimes what happens when there's a lack of that, um, I think I found in my own professional journey that uh, both being able to commiserate with peers is important. Uh, just more than you know, complaining about the process um, or the challenge itself, it's knowing that you're not alone and that this isn't you know, some um, obstacle that's just unique to your path and knowing that other people have had similar challenges and just hearing how they work through them or are working through them at the same time that you are can actually be very, um, very important, very helpful. You just don't feel like you're crazy and, and you know, the process is, is what it is, can be, can be very helpful. And the other thing, you know, beyond the peer networking is mentorship and trying to develop relationships with professionals who are in 
career paths that are similar but you know, may have um, already progressed much further in their careers and being able to develop some type of relationship with individuals um, who can mentor, I, I think is uh, sometimes overlooked but a very useful kind of um, resource to have. But again, it goes back to people mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Hi, I'm Allison Davis, and I'm a writer that's been working with NIH for about 17 years. So I've drunk the Kool-Aid, I guess you might say. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> yeah, but um, I just wanted to also thank everyone for coming today, the patients, um, everyone here. I just, it, it's so important to hear these voices and, and in a, such a passionate way. Um, I feel like when you get on a plane, people should clap and say thank you for your service because in addition to you being helped, everyone else is being helped, and I just, I feel very passionately about that. I'm curious, that said, um, what's it like when you leave the NIH bubble and interact with, in particular, um, Juliana and Jamie, and you interact with your friends and family, coworkers, when you talk about NIH, um, it's, I kind of feel like this is the best secret that we don't want to be a secret. Uh, do they know what's going on? Do you, what do you say to them? Do they understand? Um, if you could share maybe just some, some thoughts about what people know, how they feel about it, and, and what the reaction is when you tell them about your successes and challenges. Um, for me, I, I will tell it to anyone that will listen. <laughs> uh, I'm like, want to hear my story? Oh my God. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, you know, but um, no, it's funny because when I tell, um, when people are like my friends that have known me, they're just, they're just amazed because they know the Juliana that hospital all the time. It's like, if I can't come to a party and I did not call you, the only other place that I'm in is in the hospital. That's just the way it is, you know? And to the point that, you know, it's just, it's part of the way it's always been, you know? If I see, I'll, I'll be there for you. You know, I'm going to come pick you up. If I can't make it, it's because I did a U-turn to the hospital. That's just the way it's been. But now, you know, after getting the transplant, it's it's just a 180, you know, turnaround for me. It, it just changed my life. And my friends, they just kind of look back and they're like, oh, my gosh. They they still in awe. They, they just cannot believe that this thing worked, you know, that I'm here living and kicking. And... And then what I notice is then I have a, a friend of a friend, I'll call someone else and say, hey, I have this, you know, friend of mine that has sickle cell anemia. Can I get information? And, you know, that's, I pass it along. You know, I just get, in, get them, you know, in contact with the team that, you know, worked with me. And that's what I've been doing. So for me, it's, like you said, it is a secret, but it's like, it's, a secret that I want to shout out the rooftop, you know, <laughs> and I want to let people know. Um, and it's just amazing to me, like, people don't know about this. And I look back and I'm like, why didn't I know about this? Because this has been going on for years. But you just, you know, if people don't talk, you don't want to listen, then you won't know. If my, you know, the two friends that gave me those two different pieces of paper, if they didn't want to talk, I mean, and I wasn't willing to listen. I wouldn't know about NIH. So it's, you have to be willing to talk, share your experience. At the same time, the other person has to be willing to be listening. You know? So for me, I mean, they're just amazed. And I'll tell it to anyone. So I guess that's, you know, that's my experience for it. Yeah, I think um, as a kid, um, I kind of think of my experiences, my kid experience, and then my non-kid experience. Um, Are you afraid to use the word adult? I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm extremely mature. What are you talking about? Um, I, it, it, was, it was a big mystery because I would go back to school after a couple weeks of being out, and I would say I was at the hospital because of a heart condition, which wasn't technically lying. Um, so it was, it was like... Um, I don't know, it was like Big Brother back then because it was the big secret that we didn't talk about. And then once I started becoming more open with people and talking about having treatment and being HIV positive and coming to NIH, um, I think people just 
I got the sense that people just thought it was a really impressive place, but they had no idea exactly what happened or what went on here. And they would never know that, yes, we're doing the most groundbreaking research here, and we're also throwing Halloween parties for kids. <laughs> and it's everything in between. And I would come back from my days at NIH and spending time at the Children's Inn, and I, it was great. I loved it. And so for me, it was a safe place. It was my second home. And I, when I was able to talk to people about it, I bragged about it, and I was... And you know, I told them how great it was, and they're all so smart, and they're all so nice, and they're fun. And, but they really couldn't see it with their own eyes. And then from the perspective of now working in healthcare, just down the road, it's kind of funny because, yes, we know that NIH is here, and NIH is like the big important NIH. We should, if you have an infectious disease question, you call the CDC, and if anything else, you call NIH. <laughs> so except for infectious disease, you guys do that great. Um, but it was it's kind of this, this nebulous entity, I feel like, that people refer to a lot, but I don't think that everyone really knows the in and outs of what really goes on here, and it's kind of like th they need to draw the curtain and see all of the, all of the details and all of the magic that happens, because um, there's really no way to know it unless you're walking it and seeing it and living it. I think those of us that have gone to meetings and made presentations, I, I often start talks with, I'm from the NIH, how many of you have heard of the NIH? Everybody's hand goes up. How many of you know that there's a hospital at the NIH? Everybody's hand go down. So I think we as professionals have a huge responsibility to get out there, and our writer friends need to go out there and help us uh, to get the word out. So it's, a, it's a, an issue. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming, and thanks the panelists. We're an unbelievable group of people. Really appreciate it. Now, I have the great honor of um, first meeting and now getting to introduce Marsha Henderson. Um, she's the Assistant Commissioner for Health, Women's Health at the Food and Drug Administration. And in that role, she leads women's health research and outreach activities across the agency. Marsha is responsible for directing the Office of Women's Health at the FDA, coordinating FDA policy, research, and outreach efforts to protect and advance women's health, and advocating for women's participation in clinical trials and for sex, gender, and subpopulation analysis. During her almost 20 years at the FDA, Ms. Henderson has served as an expert in the development of public-private partnerships, cross-cutting research teams, and culturally appropriate consumer information. She developed the FDA's award-winning Take Time to Care outreach initiative and built a network of na national organizations to work collaboratively to disseminate FDA information. Welcome, Ms. Henderson. Well, has this been wonderful? Has this been just absolutely wonderful? Thank you so much. Now, you know, this didn't happen by accident. You know, to put together the right people at the right time and the right place to get you all to come here today. So I want to start by thanking the staff that helped us in every way put this together. The panel, as you can see, has been wonderful because you truly have given a face to clinical trials. We've made great strides as it relates to women being included in clinical trials over the years, and the discussion today illustrates that there really are women in clinical trials. We often hear women aren't in clinical trials. Women are in clinical trials. As has been said, I direct the Office of Women's Health at FDA, but as I listened to their stories, I thought about my own. You see, I too was in, or am in, a clinical trial. Some years ago, I was diagnosed with glaucoma, and uh, the traditional approach of using drops every night didn't work for me. Then I went for a laser procedure. That didn't work for me. And I got nervous. You know, when plan A and B don't work and you have to go to door number three, you start to get a little nervous. So I went to Hopkins and had a traditional surgical procedure called a tribeculectomy. 
and that does seem to have worked for me. And after my surgery, my doctor said to me, would you like to enter a clinical trial? And of course, I said, I work at FDA. <laughs> of course, I'll enter a, a clinical trial. So on that day, I too became a face of clinical trials. So once a year, I fill out a questionnaire, and I wear this motion machine and um, a variety of things, answer questions, fill out the consent forms and all of that. And you know, you can learn a lot about your condition when you enter a clinical trial. One of the things I learned was that I am officially sedentary. <laughs> so I'm working on that as well. All of the stories that we've heard from the women today say that you can and you should participate. Although we've had a lot of success with the increase of women in clinical trials, we've not been as successful with the diversity of women in clinical trials. Women of various races, ethnicities, ages, comorbidities. And to achieve this diversity, we must all play a role. The role of patient protection and education and information in research and the regulatory process as clinicians and as clinical trial participants, everyone has a role. Our speakers today have showed us the various roles that they play from Dr. Clayton. We learned that NIH has a specific way of supporting clinical trials research from the compelling keynote presentation of Dr. Lauren Wood. We learned about the P's and the C's and to the masterful moderating of Laura Lee. The panel discussion also told us that it's an interdisciplinary approach that we must take, bringing all of the skill sets that we have to this recruitment, retention, and analysis process. Now, FDA plays a very different role. We do not conduct clinical trials, although many people think that we do. We see our main role as supporting regulatory policies that promote the adequate inclusion of women in clinical research and the analysis of the data to assess sex differences. This is an essential role, although different from that of NIH and others. We evaluate the trial data submitted to us by a product sponsor, a medical product sponsor. And we do that for two reasons, to understand the risks and to assure the safety and efficacy of the products. FDA has been looking at the inclusion of women's participation for over 20 years. And while we continue to know that we need to explore even further, we have made great strides. Depending on the years and the drugs, for example, that have been studied, women have made up anywhere from 43 to 56 percent of the participants enrolled in new drug applications. There's been improvement also at the early phases as well. And although there's no consensus about the criteria that should be used to assess the adequacy and level of participation in women in clinical trials, I think that we can all say that we are not where we were 20 years ago. So what's next? My office, the Office of Women's Health at FDA, and the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health will be collaborating on a national campaign to raise awareness about the importance of participation in clinical trials and of diverse participation in clinical trials. We will share best practices related to clinical research design, recruitment, retention, and subpopulation analysis. We will conduct educational research in select disease and therapeutic areas, and we will con convene scientific dialogues and identify training resources for investigators and health professionals. The workshop today is the first, we hope, in a series and I think you all have given us a fabulous kickoff. I encourage you all to look at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, as was stated so often, people don't know about clinical trials. NIH is a fabulous place, but it's not the only place. 
We have clinical trials being conducted around the country in a variety of settings at many, many institutions, but there is a location that will let you know about all of them, and that's called clinicaltrials.gov. I encourage you to look at the NIH and FDA website for additional information, and I encourage you to talk with the women in your networks, your social networks, your professional networks, um, your family networks. How often do you talk about a clinical trial? I know I don't go to dinner and, or to the movies and say, you know, I'm in a clinical trial. <laughs> I, and why don't I? The question is not what I have not been doing, double negative, uh, but why aren't I talking about a clinical trial? They're at all ranges, whether it is a life-saving procedure, a sight-saving procedure, or just general background knowledge to set the stage for future investigation. Clinical trials are so important, and we have to get the word out. We've got to start talking about it. We've got to share our stories. Everyone in this room has a story, whether you engage in it as a clinician or an investigator, a social worker, a patient. We all have a story, and we need to tell those stories. So from this moment on, let's commit to telling our stories and to continuing the conversation. Let's engage, engage, engage everyone we know in the process. All are needed. Men, for example, are needed in the clinical trials assessment as we determine what works best for women and for men in this process. So I thank you all for coming. The panel will be here uh, after we close. And I want to thank all of you again for telling your stories and just keep telling your story again and again until we can bring more people into this space that we call clinical research. Thank you.